Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is off. Tonight, the cost of COVID-19. We took on debt so Canadians wouldn't have to. $343 billion, a staggering deficit not seen since the Second World War and no clear way out. How do you kickstart the economy when parents can't work? It's hard. I mean, I'll be honest, I am tired physically, I am tired mentally. The child care challenge that may only get worse come September. Surviving a heat wave during a pandemic. You want to get out of the house, but then you're afraid to leave the house. The new threat facing long-term care homes. They've been our loyal companions through the pandemic. Last couple of weeks, I've tried to leave a little bit more. Preparing your pooch for the return to work. This is The Nash. There are all kinds of ways to measure the impact of this pandemic on Canadians, like the number of COVID-19 cases or the number of deaths. Well, today there's a new number, stunningly high from the federal government. $343 billion. That is how big Canada's deficit is expected to get this year after months of emergency spending. And we aren't out of the woods yet. So what's the plan going forward? We'll put that question to the finance minister in a bit. But first, let's start with the details released today and that big number. David Cochran with the context and the criticisms. From the map to the mask. There's never been a fiscal update like this. Some will criticize us on the cost of action, but our government knew that the cost of inaction would have been far greater. The cost of COVID is enormous. The deficit now projected at $343 billion, the biggest since the Second World War. The debt projected to hit a record high of $1.2 trillion. The economic toll, the worst since the Great Depression, with the economy expected to shrink by 6.8%. The job numbers, staggering. Five and a half million Canadians have lost their jobs or most of their hours. That's one-third of the entire workforce. At a time when Canada's, Canadian workers and families are facing significant hardship, austerity and tightening your belt is not the answer. But millions are tightening their belts because even after all that spending, thousands of businesses are still closed, their employees off the job. So the one new measure, $50 billion more for future changes to the wage subsidy to help companies reopen and rehire. The details still to be determined. The Prime Minister has absolutely no plan to help Canadians return to work. No plan to guide our economic recovery. I think we need to see a forward plan. I, this, I think the pressure should increase in the government to, to have a fiscal plan, a strategy for this year and next year. What's missing here is what comes next. This update is largely backwards looking, a tally of the costs of the emergency response. But there is still a need for an economic recovery plan, which will mean billions more in new spending and new programs. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. So on that, let's bring in Rosie Barton, our chief political correspondent. Rosie, this number clearly re reflects the immediate spending happening, but what about economic recovery later down the road? Well, uh, you know, as, as David mentioned, the government will have more to tell us in the fall, for sure. Uh, but there is a desire right now inside government to talk about the urgency that still exists, because there are so many Canadians that, you know, still have reduced work hours, aren't back to their jobs, don't know what the future holds. So they don't want to get too far down the road, if you will, um, until some of those things are dealt with. There's also other bits and pieces that they need to work out. They are still talking to provinces about where $14 billion is going to to go and how they might be able to support childcare, for instance, because that will be critical to the economy reopening uh, in September too. The other part of this, though, the recovery part of this, is that the government is well aware that the economy is not just going to start spinning uh, on its own without any help. There is going to have to be a conversation around stimulus and where to put that stimulus to try and grow out of the grow their way out of this, which is what the government wants to do. It won't look like anything we've seen before. Before, but then again, Adrian, none of this has. Yeah, no kidding. Huge decisions ahead. Yeah. Rosie, thanks very much. Thanks. Now, Rosie will be back in about 20 minutes with a special edition of That Issue and an interview with Finance Minister Bill Morneau. Now, though, let's focus in on child care, which is the issue for a lot of parents right now. 
And as Jacqueline Hansen explains, it is key to economic recovery. It's double duty for the Woodwards, both now working from home due to COVID-19. It's hard. I mean, I'll be honest, there are days that I am, I'm tired. The childcare they used to rely on has reopened, but capacity is limited, and there's no plan announced yet for school in the fall. Come September, uh, if I do have to go back into the office, before and after care becomes a very big concern for us. It could become an economic roadblock. So we do have people now on our waiting list to, that need care. Kim Yeaman's opening one of her child care centers next week. She's bringing back all 10 staff, but instead of 80 children, she can take only 24. This is a severe loss situation that even with the 75% wage subsidy, their fees will not even offset the cost of those staff. If capacity remains capped and the federal wage subsidy and rent relief run out, we would be closed. And childcare spaces could disappear permanently. Now we're going to lose some share of it. And there seems to be no plan to preserve that capacity. This economist says that could hit women hardest. They've already lost more jobs than men due to COVID 19, what she calls a she session. For any kind of she covery. In other words, women being able to go back to work should there be a job there for them. If they don't have childcare, they can't go back. A smaller workforce, lower productivity and less consumer spending. We are actually staring down the barrel of an economic depression. Ottawa is giving that $14 billion to the provinces to help get people back to work, but it's not specifically for childcare. Daycare providers want a plan and so do parents. Continuing like this, likely isn't sustainable. If I had to, I, I would, I could. Um, do I want to? No. <laughs> Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. And even more economic fallout today from the pandemic. Via Rail announced it will temporarily lay off about a thousand workers, saying it doesn't see ridership getting back to normal anytime soon. The layoffs will take effect on July 24th. Now, COVID-19 is still subdued in Canada, registering fewer than 300 new cases for the fifth straight day. But the latest modeling from Public Health Canada confirms this is far from over. It shows that in places like the Toronto area, cases keep emerging from the community, while in Alberta, outbreaks are more localized. Today, a single Edmonton hospital is now close to new patients after what it's calling a full facility outbreak. And as Rafi Bujikanian shows us, finding the cause is not easy. We all have to remain vigilant about COVID-19. Vigilance the Misericordia Hospital has only increased in the last few weeks. An outbreak has left three patients dead and at least 35 patients and staff infected. Now they're closing their doors to the public. It's meant cancelling the surgeries that were ongoing there, the outpatient appointments, We've moved labor and delivery and closed the emergency department. Some surgeries have moved to other hospitals and health officials are busy trying to figure out which staff need to get tested for COVID-19. Alberta's infection rates have been relatively low. Honorable member for Edmonton McClung has a question. So the opposition wants to know how an outbreak could shut down a hospital. To the minister, what emergency steps have you taken to prevent the spread of COVID-19? We uh, continue to work very closely with AHS and the medical officer of health for the Edmonton zone. I would certainly like to hear more about how this process occurred. The hospital says the outbreak started with two infected units, though has not disclosed which ones, and it's still not clear how the virus got into the hospital, then spread. It, it could be a failure of PPE. It could be a, a failure of mask discipline. This epidemiologist says tracking that down is difficult in large healthcare facilities with multiple people going in and out and moving around. And with growing concerns about airborne transmission, there is something else to check too. We need to take ventilation systems more seriously. The appropriate filters have to be put into place. The Misericordia says it's looking into its ventilation system. In the meantime, Alberta Health insists other hospitals can pick up the slack while it gets this outbreak under control. Rafi Bujikani in CBC News, Edmonton. The coronavirus continues to surge in the U.S. as a wave of infections sweeps across the south. 60,000 new cases 
yesterday alone. Well, today the U.S. hit another awful high water mark and the virus just keeps spreading faster. So the first case in the United States was detected on January 21st. It took 99 days for the cases to climb to 1 million in late April. It hit 2 million about six weeks after that. As of today, only 28 days later, there are more than 3 million cases in the United States. So that deeply concerning number was the backdrop as the White House Coronavirus Task Force held an update today. As Katie Simpson tells us, their key focus today was still reopening as well as dealing with an ever-present wild card, the president's Twitter account. It's time for us to get our kids back to school. And then a few uh, The White House Coronavirus Task Force is ramping up pressure to reopen schools, even as the U.S. marks 3 million COVID cases and counting. Ultimately, it's not a matter of if schools should reopen. It's simply a matter of how. New safety guidelines for reopening will be released next week after the president attacked the current advice from his own government agency, which emphasizes good hygiene and physical distancing. The president said today we just don't want the guidance to be too tough. In a tweet, Donald Trump wrote, I disagree with the Centers for Disease Control on their very tough and expensive guidelines for opening schools, calling it very impractical. The White House denies Trump is pressuring medical experts to change public health advice because he doesn't like it. No, not at all, but the president made his opinion quite clear publicly this morning on Twitter for all to see. Trump also threatened to cut funding to schools that don't reopen, a threat New York's governor mocked. Well, I won't give New York funding. You don't give us any funding now. Thank you very much. Whatever recommendations are released, the head of the CDC says guidelines will not be mandatory. CDC, but I want to make it very clear that what is not the intent of CDC's guidelines is to be used as a rationale to keep schools closed. The task force did admit some schools and hotspots won't be able to reopen. What I wear if I'm People there are being asked to resume strict physical distancing practices. Not only use the face coverings, not going to bars, not going to indoor dining, but really not gathering in homes either. Trump's promotion of physical distancing is under fresh scrutiny after health officials in Tulsa say nearly 500 new COVID cases are likely linked to his re-election rally there. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. After calls for change south of the border and teams like the Washington Redskins reviewing its name, a Canadian football team is following suit. The Edmonton Eskimos said today review of its team name will be accelerated. The announcement comes as one of the team's biggest sponsors threatened to cut ties, saying the name is no longer appropriate. The team says it will provide an update on the review by the end of July. Montreal's new policy on police street checks is meant to restore trust after accusations of widespread racial profiling. But as Alison Northcott tells us, for many, it just doesn't go far enough, especially for those who've been the targets of random stops again and again. Eric Preach says he's been stopped by police countless times. My maximum in one month was five times. Uh, which, which is a lot, just, just to begin with, and there was no reason. A report last fall found black and indigenous people were four to five times more likely than white people to be stopped and questioned by Montreal police. Until now, there was no policy for street checks for any force in Quebec. Now, Montreal's police chief says those checks will have to be based on observable facts and not motivated by discrimination. Well, the police after, officers have to work with observable facts which gives them a reason to interact with the person and to do a police check. So that's a major change for the police officers. Officers will have to tell people why they're stopping them, but won't have to tell them that it is their right not to answer their questions. There's not going to be any meaningful changes at all. Critics say the policy is weak because it doesn't apply to traffic stops or include sanctions for officers who don't follow it. There has to be an early warning system. It has to be tied into sanction. If you have repeat offenders, or serial profilers within your ranks, you've got to be able to fire them. The fact that the policy refers to ethno-cultural discrimination and not racial profiling is another flaw, says racial this background. activist. It just shows that there's a serious disconnect between the Montreal police and the very racialized communities and drivers and pedestrians who are often stopped. 
Montreal City Council passed a motion last year asking police to stop street checks altogether, but the force says they're an important tool. It's so broad, it's so vague. Eric Preach says he doesn't expect the policy will make much of a difference. I hope that it's a door to a better understanding of what the bigger issue is. He wants more police accountability and further changes to address problems he says go far beyond street checks. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. The Prime Minister today talked about the steps his government will be taking to address systemic racism in Canada. Cabinet has put together a work plan for the summer months. Our goal is to come up with strong policies that will help eliminate barriers facing Indigenous peoples, racialized people and persons with disabilities. That plan will include looking at ways to modernize the country's policing structures, expanding First Nations policing to more communities and bringing in better protections for temporary foreign workers. A new report by the country's Auditor General discovered a major failure from Canada's Border Services Agency. Turns out tens of thousands of deportations might not have taken place and the agency lost track of these people. Catherine Cullen explains. There has been so much scrutiny of some of the people arriving in Canada. This report raises questions about how and whether some leave. The Auditor General found that as of April 2019, there were 50,000 individuals with so-called enforceable removal orders, where a person from another country no longer has the legal right to stay in Canada. In many cases, these are failed asylum claimants. The report revealed that for the majority, 34,700 cases in the wanted inventory, individuals' whereabouts were unknown. In the case of criminal cases, these are the highest priority for removal, yet we found that many remained uh, in the agency's inventory for years. Well, the findings overall are pretty damning. This isn't simply a bureaucratic issue, but one of national security, says this professor. If you can't enforce these removal orders, then you're allowing dangerous individuals, whether they're criminals, war criminals, others, to remain in Canada and often remain in Canada in ways that you don't even know where they are. Still, the numbers may not tell the whole story. People may have left without the border agency's knowledge, says this lawyer. We've also had cases where CBSA will call us to, to discuss um, a client's case and we let them know that the client, as a matter of fact, left months ago. The Prime Minister today pledged to do a better job of ensuring the integrity of the immigration system. We will uh, be looking very closely and following the recommendations made by the Auditor General. No plan, specifically. The Canada Border Services Agency says it's reviewing all of its outstanding cases and focusing on those of greatest concern. But Wark says in order for the agency to get its act together, a more in-depth, regular review is needed. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Ontario and Quebec are sweating through some seriously hot weather right now and coping is complicated during a pandemic. You want to get out of the house, but then you're afraid to leave the house. Up next, keeping cool when things are closed. Much more on that sky-high deficit number 343 billion. The finance minister on what comes next. Plus, ad issue is here for a special Wednesday edition. And man's best friends sure have become used to us being around. Last couple of weeks, I've tried to leave a little bit more. Managing Fido's feelings as we go back to work. We're back in two. Welcome back. Officials in British Columbia are investigating a motel fire in Prince George, which left three people dead. <laughs> Crews battled flames and heavy smoke when they arrived just after 9 o'clock. It's not clear how this fire started, but it is being described as suspicious. And Environment Canada confirmed four tornadoes touched down in Alberta yesterday. All of them were brief and given a rating of EF0. That's the lowest possible for a twister. No major damage has been reported. Wind warnings, though, remain in effect in the southeastern part of the province tonight. Yep, definitely some extreme weather in Toronto today. Heavy rain, flooded parts of the city and strong winds knocked down trees. The city was under a tornado watch for part of the afternoon. Some 45,000 customers were without power at some point this afternoon. All of this in the midst of a sweltering heat wave. 
And as the CBC's Thomas Degler tells us, the pandemic is only making things that much more complicated. Getting tested for COVID-19 may be uncomfortable, but waiting in the heat can be unbearable. Or how about the unavoidable sweat that comes with wearing that mask in the sun? Such is the trouble enduring an especially hot start to summer amid the pandemic. It's almost like desert kind of conditions. Very, very hot uh, morning, noon and night. It's, it's relentless. It's really a marker of, hey, what we might see more as the norm. This heat wave came earlier than usual, blasting parts of central Canada with temperatures above 30 for seven days straight. More than some cities normally see all summer. I was really surprised that it's uh, been this hot for so long. It's hot because you you want to get out of the house, but then you're afraid to leave the house. A pandemic means fewer places to cool off, from this indoor water park in Windsor, shuttered by the virus, to all those air-conditioned movie theaters still unable to show movies. Some have no choice but to turn to emergency cooling centers, like Brian Riccardi, homeless for three months, and staying at this center now for five nights. The floors are really cold and there are no blankets, but it's better than staying on the streets. Those already put at risk by the virus are made all the more vulnerable now. Consider many rooms and long-term care homes in Ontario and Quebec have no air conditioning. I'm not worried about an outbreak of COVID-19, a wave of COVID-19 over the summer. Now what I'm worried about is a new wave of deaths that will occur over the summer, basically because of heat-induced illness. Toronto may have seen afternoon thunderstorms and flooding, but remember, the hottest days of the year are usually still two weeks away. Thomas Dagg, the CBC News, Toronto. Still ahead on the national, as the country starts to reopen, your dog might have to get used to a little more alone time. Spending as little as 15 minutes a day with the dog, talking to them and massaging them. Expert advice on keeping your dog happy and your shoes from being chewed. But first, let's get back to our top story, Canada's $343 billion deficit. Chief political correspondent Rosemary Barton is back. Adrian, today's fiscal snapshot gave us a sense of what a pandemic economy looks like. Hundreds of billions in deficit, over a trillion dollars in total debt. I'll ask the finance minister what this means for Canadians, plus at issue on what the government is not talking about. Chantal, Andrew and Althea will join me after the break. The COVID-19 pandemic has led to an unprecedented economic crisis, forcing the country to shut down and leaving many Canadians without work. The federal government responding with billions in financial aid, but with no spring budget, Ottawa hasn't shared its own fiscal projections until today. A snapshot with a federal deficit expected to reach $343 billion and a total debt level set to exceed $1 trillion. Already unprecedented numbers for a crisis that's far from over. And the Minister of Finance, Bill Morneau, joins me now for a closer look at today's fiscal snapshot. Thanks for making the time, Minister. I'm happy to be on your show, Rosie. So uh, this is spending that we have not seen sec since the Second World War, $343 billion in deficit, obviously in extraordinary circumstances. But do you think that deficits still matter in terms of trying to get rid of them or how Canadians understand them? It, it always matters to be fiscally responsible. In this situation, you know, we were clear. We knew that we needed to support Canadians during an extraordinary time. We knew that the federal government was in the best position to deliver at scale and with speed, and we had the best balance sheet. So uh, it matters to be fiscally responsible. The only responsible thing to do in this situation was to support Canadians. Now, obviously, right now, you're not over overly concerned about the deficit and, and even debt repayment because of low interest rates. What about the idea, though, that interest rates will eventually go back up? Uh, how do you plan to deal with that? Well, your, your, point, your first point's correct. I mean, we, we have the, the lowest cost of carrying debt that we've, we've ever had. So actually, our cost of carrying the debt will be lower this year than we even expected a year ago. That said, uh, we do need to think about the future. We are going to extend the term of our debt. Much of our new debt will be for longer term, 10 and 30 years in many cases. 
Uh, but we're going to need to deal with this. This is a shock to our system. Uh, we're, we're focused on how we can grow our economy, create jobs, create opportunities. That will be the way that we deal with this, uh, this you know, enormous challenge. I, I know you don't want to talk recovery today. The Prime Minister didn't really want to get into it either when I asked him earlier, and I know you will have something in the fall. But can you give Canadians a sense of how the economy or the recovery will look different than it did pre-COVID? What I can say most clearly is our recovery will very much follow our ability to deal with the health challenge we're facing. So Canadians have done a good job. We've worked together to, to flatten the curve. We need to keep those efforts because that is what is actually going to enable us to a safe restart of the economy. And we need to do it in steps. So right now it is about that safe restart. It's about making sure we can get back to work, that we protect people as we get back to work, that we can test and trace if we have challenges as we get back to work. So that's where we're focused right now. In the fall, we hope that with that success, we'll be able to talk about a longer-term recovery. In just a couple of seconds, uh, Minister, if there is a second wave and people need uh, an emergency relief benefit again, are you prepared to do that again to support Canadians again? We, we've known through this, this challenging time that we, we need to support people. There's, there's extraordinary issues that families are facing. Uh, so we will, we will continue to think about how we move our programs in accordance with what we hope is a, a restart. Uh, but we're going to need to be there to support Canadians in the face of, of continuing challenges, adapting and being nimble. We will continue to do that and we'll try to do that in a very fiscally responsible way that will enable us to get to the next stage, the growth phase, after. Okay. Minister Morneau, thank you for making the time today. I appreciate it, sir. Thanks. Thanks so much. For more on the political impact of the numbers and what the road ahead looks like or doesn't, let's bring in At Issue for a special Wednesday edition of the panel. I made them all come back. Chantal Hiver, Andrew Coyne and Althea Raj all here tonight. Chantal, let's start with you. Um, so some big numbers that might be surprising to some Canadians. Uh, is this something, do you think, that that... I don't know, that a government has to better explain to Canadians that it all makes sense because it's one-time spending because of the pandemic? I think most Canadians uh, who have been keeping up with the news expected those numbers to be really big, uh, and mm -hmm. they certainly lived up to that advanced billing. They may be higher than some expected, but mm -hmm. we're talking about bigger and bigger than bigger. Uh, yeah. uh, nothing in the normal realm. Uh, and I don't think I've ever expected to be talking about uh, anything related to a federal budget in any way, shape, or form that had numbers like that in it. The real unknown, uh, and I think that's where the government cannot just let this slip, is that these numbers are almost the best case scenario. They do not take into account what happens if we're hit hard, as the U.S. currently is, mm -hmm. and how you deal with a big second wave. Well, and that may be, Andrew, why the, why the finance minister said we'll have more to say in the fall about recovery, because they are so, what, do you think, concerned about what recovery could look like, really don't have a sense of anything? or they're trying to condition expectations. I think this explains why they've been so reluctant to produce uh, even this quote-unquote snapshot until now, uh, because these are much worse than anybody had expected or predicted. Uh, and as Chantel says, this is the optimistic scenario. This is if we get a relatively orderly uh, um, you know, recovery from the pandemic and from the economy. If it's worse, it's going to be worse. Remember also, this is just for year one. They refuse to tell us the numbers for years two, three, and four. Again, I, gr I grant there's some uncertainty about that. But I think what the public needs and wants at this point is some sense, first of all, that the government is itself aware of the dimensions of the problem, and secondly, is willing to level with the public about that, about the kinds of hardships and sacrifices that are ahead of us. And thirdly, that they're willing to, to, to spell out some kind of, of plan for how we start to bring, bring this deficit down. Remember, it's 16 percent this year of GDP. But on any construction of the numbers, it's going to be at least 5 or 6 percent next year and the year after that and the year after that. Uh, are we just going to live with permanent 5% of GDP deficits, or is there going to be some kind of longer-term plan to get us back into fiscal sanity? Uh, Althea, what, what do you think about that? Well, I don't think actually the public cares that much. I think the public is focused on how they're handling their own household budgets, and they are thankful. I think like the the government's line about we're all in this together, and the government has basically made... Uh, 
fiscal sacrifices so uh, Kane households did not have to bear the mm -hmm, brunt of mm -hmm. the challenge or had to uh, to pay to dig into their savings less or go into debt less because the federal government was willing to you know ensure that they were safe and mostly kept at home instead of going into the workspace and I think really the best thing that has happened for Justin Trudeau and I'm not taking anything from from what Chantal and Andrew have said, because I do agree that like, there's no recovery plan in this, there's no future uh, look ahead. It is that there is Donald Trump and chaos south of the border, and there is an example over there about how things can happen when you have no plan and nothing seems to happen properly. And I think Canadians are, are looking at that and thinking, okay, well, you know, these are big numbers that the government is saying at the moment, but at least things are not as bad as they are in the United States. Oh, Chantal, yeah. And while the numbers are, are certainly big, stunning, and they will have consequences for years to come, I'm not totally convinced that the, it is possible for a government to come up with a serious, solid recovery plan with all that is unknown ahead of it still. Uh, this isn't as if um, something big happened and now we're going to rebuild. We are still right. in this pandemic process. I think from those numbers, though, what you can see is that we can't, uh, or the federal government cannot afford a second lockdown that would have it uh, support Canadians in the way that it did over the first one. Uh, you know, I, I tried to ask the, the prime minister today, Andrew, like what would the economy look like, uh, you know, f going forward? And, and that's, not even, that's not even something they wanted to talk about today because they want people to still be talking about the urgency of the situation as opposed to the recovery. And they want people to be looking at all the measures they put in place. I mean, most of this, this thing was a kind of a recitation of past policies that they put in place, which is fine. But I, I think what we need at this point is some sense of what's the urgency on the government side. For example, is it planned to roll back all of these short term crisis things all at once in one year? Or is it going to listen, is it going to, listen to the council of people who say we need we need fiscal stimulus on top of this? We need to wind back yeah. really gradually. That will have huge implications for the kinds of, of, of deficit and debt numbers we're looking at uh, going forward. You know, they say, and there's some truth to this, that we don't need to worry about this because interest rates are so low. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that is predicated on the idea that they're going to be able to borrow a lot of this long term. They announced that, but just simply announcing that's their intention and actually carrying it off with these kinds of numbers is two different things. And it's going to be really concerning to see with every government in the world coming to, to the market at the same time with these enormous deficits, whether in fact they'll be able to load all this into the longer term debt markets. Althea, you wanted in there, sorry. Yeah, it just what we got today was basically a snapshot in time. And then the finance minister telling us that they're ready and willing and they want to spend a lot more money. Uh, they said taxes are not going to increase, that M Minister Morneau's basically spelled out that he believes that what the, the economy needs is even more uh, federal spending. Mm -hmm. He talked about sick leave, child care, more help for the vulnerable, more help for people in nursing homes. He outlined areas in which the federal government is willing to spend more money helping municipalities, for example. Um, and that is all going... Like, today's snapshot is lovely, uh, but it is not at all... a. Uh, the end all and be all and what's going to happen, you know, when we have this discussion in December, they clearly have and are communicating that they expect to and plan to spend a hell of a lot more money. Can, can they grow their way out of where they are now? Because that's the other thing that the finance minister suggested there, Chantal. Well, they can grow their way out of a federal election uh, with the, the way they are now. <laughs> uh, you know, if you call this a, a lovely snapshot, <laughs> it's an interesting way to say it. I <laughs> think most uh, people would say, B -b -b -b, can we file this one away and for not put it in the family album? But um, <laughs> if they want to stay in government, they, it is a minority government, this talk about you know, uh, sick leave, etc., will keep them going. It is also going to get them reelected b between now and 18 months, mm. uh, rather than the speech of we're going to come down on you with more taxes and cuts to programs uh, to yeah. people who are already impo impoverished. So if you we're talking about the politics of this, yeah. uh, it is possibly, I don't know, bad policy, too early to tell, certainly good politics. 
Okay, I got to leave it there. You know, thank you. Thank you. I, right. I got to leave. I'm sorry. Thank you all for coming That's in. Right. I appreciate it. Uh, before we go, be sure to subscribe to our podcast. It's on any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. I'll give Andrew ne- more time next time. I'll be back. They'll all be back with the ad issue panel tomorrow. We're going to be taking some of your political questions. For now, though, back to Adrian in Toronto. All right, thanks, Rosie. Next on The National, we answer your pandemic questions, lots of them about what's safe to do as the economy reopens. Like this one, how risky is it to stay at a hotel during the pandemic? How can I mitigate the risk of catching the virus? The answer right after this. All right, welcome back. Time now for your COVID-19 questions. And with me tonight is infectious diseases specialist, Dr. Susie Hoda. Thank you for being with us. So let's get right to some of these questions. First one, how risky is it to stay at a hotel during the pandemic? And how can I mitigate the risk of catching the virus? So I think that depends on a number of factors. So where are you traveling to and how many cases of COVID are in that area? Do they have travel restrictions and are you likely to come across people from other parts of the world? And then what's a building like? Is it an old hotel with poor ventilation? Because that's an important factor to consider. Um, And then finally, what kind of policies does a hotel have? So are they screening their staff for symptoms? Do they have good cleaning? Uh, What's the food service like? So, you know, I'd encourage people to actually call in advance and get that information. But if you do have to travel, I would say the best way to reduce the risk is wear a mask anytime you're outside of your hotel room. Maintain your distance from people as much as possible. Do not take any food buffet services if they're available and always carry carry hand sanitizer with you. Always a good tip. Okay, this one's really interesting. What do we know about how the virus is mutating as it spreads? So all viruses mutate and we know that, and most of those mutations are pretty benign. Um, What we see with the SARS-CoV-2 virus is that it's not mutating very quickly. And that's good news for vaccine development because we want the virus that uh, is used to develop the the vaccine to actually match what's gonna be circulating at the time we deploy the vaccine uh, as much as possible. Um, But the other thing we look for is, are there any changes in the virus that might make it more transmissible or more severe in infection? And right now, the one mutation that's really caught a lot of attention is one in which there are more spikes that are on the, on the virus. And those spikes are actually involved in the entry of the virus into your cells. And so there's a question about whether this makes it more infectious. And uh, we're, we're just waiting to get more information and more studies to see how it actually pans out in human beings, um, not just in a lab setting. Okay, very briefly, time for just one more. As a fitness instructor, I'm concerned about going back to teach group fitness classes. What can I do to minimize risk for myself and my clients? Well, it might be a good idea to think about online classes or outdoor group classes and really restrict the number of people who are there. I mean, that when you're doing fitness, you can't really wear a mask well and you're breathing pretty hard. So, um, you know, those kinds of factors would be important to consider. So outdoors, screen your, your folks and uh, don't share equipment would be my advice. All right, Dr. Hoda, thanks very much. You're welcome. So we are asking your questions about COVID-19 as often as possible. So send us the questions you have. Message us directly on Instagram at CBC The National or send us an email at covid at cbc.ca. A big part of covering the COVID-19 story at CBC News is telling the stories of those who've died. We call the project Lives Remembered. Well, tonight, Frank and Doris Perez are remembered by their son. My name is Ian Perez and I lost both my parents, Frank and Doris, to COVID-19 in under a month. Doris was 84 years old and Frank had just turned 86. Mom and dad decided to emigrate to Canada in October 1972. They left their families and everything they knew in India in search of a prosperous future for their three sons, Colin, Clinton, and myself. Mom and dad completed each other. They had longed for each other when they were apart and together they were full of life and lit up the rooms into which they walked. Mom had a soul-warming smile and extraordinary inner strength to persevere. She lost her father when she was young and was put in charge by her mother to help raise her seven siblings. She taught us unconditional love and important life skills. Mom had somehow committed to memory the birthdays of all of the uncles and aunties and nieces and nephews all over the world. Never did a birthday go by without a telephone birthday wish from Auntie Doris. 
Dad was a mechanical engineer by training and a very talented handyman. He was an avid bodybuilder before coming to Canada. And he loved his sports, especially hockey and cricket. They lived for their weekend getaways to their place in Vermont, and they adored their dogs over the years that kept them close company. The time spent over the years with mom and dad are precious moments in time that are permanently etched in our memories. We miss you dearly, mom and dad, and we ask that you save us a rum and coke for the next time we meet to play cards and catch up on all the latest jokes. We love you. Both parents gone terrible. Two of the more than 8,700 Canadians lost to COVID-19. We've gathered many of their stories online. You can find them at cbc.ca slash remembered. I'm Josh Block. Tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Frontburner, China's sweeping national security law has Hong Kong protesters holding blank signs, and one pro-democracy leader has fled the city. I'll talk to Nathan Law about why. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Ever since COVID-19 banished work to the home, few have benefited more than dogs. The 24-7 promise of love and attention from their favorite human never gets old, for them at least. What those happy canines cannot know is it was never supposed to last. As work life returns to normal, dogs are in for a shock. Chris O'Neill Yates explores the do's and the don'ts of heading back to work and leaving forlorn, four-legged friends behind. For months, Finn has enjoyed his owner's undivided attention. But as of Monday, Glenn Redmond, who's also a dog trainer, is heading back to work. And Finn, well, he'll be on his own for most of the day. Last couple of weeks, I've tried to leave a little bit more so he gets used to the fact that, you know, he's not coming every single time. We've all heard the horror stories. Owners who come home to find their house destroyed. Well, the first thing is not to punish the dog because you know, the dog lives in a one-second world. So the dog is not at home ripping up the sofa going, I'm going to be in so much trouble, but I, but I just I have to do it. On Monday, Redmond says he'll leave for work calmly. No fussing over Finn with an emotional goodbye. All we do is raise the dog's energy levels and then leave, which, which can then sort of, you know, uh, be put into uh, destruction on your couch. And when he arrives home at the end of the day, again, no big fuss. Because then at least we're rewarding calmness, not excitability. Our hypothesis is that the dogs who will be distressed when people go back to their normal life are the dogs who already had problems. Dr. Karen Overall is part of an international study on behavioral problems during the pandemic. We see always on top of you and staring at you and licking you and looking at you. And if he is, that's not a normal behavior. That behavior requires some professional help, says Overall, but owners have no reason to feel guilty about going back to work. Spending as little as 15 minutes a day just quietly with the dog, just talking to them and massaging them, not only decreases the dog's stress level, but has benefits for the humans. Good dogs before the pandemic will be good dogs when their owners return to work. And Finn? He'll enjoy every minute of extra attention while he can. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Conception Bay South, Newfoundland. Right after this, a moment one mom will always remember. I still close my eyes and I just see him like floating away from me. A harrowing nightmare stopped by a family of Good Samaritans. Next. Well, these smiling faces tell a happy story that could have ended so differently. Eight-year-old Frankie, in the bottom corner here, was swept down a roaring river, but the Cologne family was there just in time. The tale behind that rescue is our moment. I got stuck in the current, and my mom couldn't grab me. And I was falling down. I couldn't breathe because I was going up and down and up and down. And I just see him like floating away from me, you know, and it was really fast and I just, I just ran and I didn't know how to get to him. I see a head in the water. Mm -hmm. It was um, Frankie, of course. And then we're like, Dad, Dad, there's someone drifting down in the river. And 
He jumps in. I ran along the side of the rocks here. I flicked my phone down and I jumped in right around here, I guess. And as I felt myself getting closer to him, I said, okay, you're gonna get him. I just inched myself in a bit and the two of us were above water. And I felt confident then that we weren't going any further. And then Frankie was just in my arms and I was just trying to calm him down to, to catch his breath and, and then we were okay. It was scary that day, but we were all okay. So that's all that matters. You're absolutely right. So that river was raging that day. Darren's a uh, phys ed teacher, those instincts helped. Uh, Frankie dragged his feet along the rocks, that helped too, and it's all a good thing because there are rapids just below that river, amazing. That is a national for Wednesday, July 8th. Good night.